It was 1863. The bloodiest war in history raged. Throughout the American Civil War, child soldiers endured horrific and unethical lives, despite their battles achieving in the long term. Like so many other boys tired of dull farming life, this powder boy signed up for adventure. If boys joined to fight for a cause, it was to preserve the union. Although it's technically illegal for boys to fight, most lied about their age or recruiters might swap. Youths were an enormous and vital part of each military, especially the Norths. More than 1 million Union soldiers were 18 or under, 300 were 13 or under, and 25 soldiers were 10 or under. 14.5% of Confederate soldiers were under 18. 33% of Union soldiers were under 21, while almost 90% from both sides were under 30. Many boys had never played a drum, while others couldn't climb onto their boats, but received little training. Despite that, musician boys drummed or played different commands. When they mastered the, their current instrument, the 40,000 drummer and bugle boys were allowed to try a different one. Boys' drums were also used to carry cards, food, and even small dogs. All soldier boys had many other uses, such as improving soldiers' morale, grooming horses, cooking food, collecting wood for fires, and playing cards in their free time. But a sol boy's soldiering life was even worse than that of adults. They were bullied and tormented by the older, became the first to go unfed if food ran out, and were especially sickened seeing their friends and comrades die, and were frequently homesick. And although most boys didn't have guns, the opposite side would shoot at them anyway. Powder boys, or powder monkeys, were small, fast children who handed powder from the ship's hold to the gunners who manned cannons on the deck. These brave kids were in even more danger than drummers, although they did hide behind the ship's gunwale and frequently ran down to the hold. Moving backward, the USS New Hampshire was a 2,675-ton, 820-officer sailing ship, originally built for line tactics in 1819, although not put into service until the Civil War, in which everything was needed. It was then refitted as a store ship, an armed boat that primarily carried supplies. The USS New Hampshire traveled from Port Royal to blockade the entrance of Charleston Harbor as part of the Union's Anaconda plan equipped with doldron guns and 200-pound parrot rifles. At that time, John Daldron led Union naval forces, and General Gilmore led the Union army in a joint offensive against Fort Wagner and Sumter. General Beauregard led Confederate defenses stationed inside the forts. In August 1863, the first shot of the siege of Charleston Harbor echoed through the crashing of ocean waves. But this time, a small boy, representing thousands like him, would be in grave danger. After two catastrophic Confederate victories, when the Union tried to take Morris Island in July, the North tried a third time. When they fell back three more times with usual tactics, the Union dug strategic trenches toward Fort Wagner, as well as shined floodlights on the fort to blind the defenders, reducing their accuracy. The Union artillery from land and on ships fired. Meanwhile, the defenders shot at Union soldiers from the fort. This went on for weeks. When Union forces were finally in range of Fort Sumter, 1,000 shells were fired from artillery on surrounding ships, prompting General Beauregard to remove the fort's guns. General Gilmore then reported in a telegram to the Department of War, Fort Sumter is a shapeless and harmless mass of ruin. 
Meanwhile, back on Morris Island, the Union constructed elaborate batteries. One 200-pound shell was even fired into the city of Charleston. On September 5th, the Army sent men and the Navy used artillery to attack Fort Wagner, killing 100 of the 400 defenders. And finally, Gilmore's soldiers reached rifle pits outside the fort. Back on the Powder Boy's boat, the picture we focused on was taken, as the USS New Hampshire blockaded Charleston Harbor and firing one or two shots. Cannon shots, screaming, splashing, and crimson flames could be seen ahead, while a chain of old wooden boats drifted in a line to the side, blockading. If you looked behind, you could see sunset and breathe fresh air. That's war. On September 6th, 36 hours after the renewed offensive, Colonel Keat reported conditions were intolerable and was ordered to abandon Morris Island, giving the Union a strategic spot in Charleston Harbor as well as causing much damage. But it came at a cost. There were 816 Confederate casualties and 859 Union casualties. Two days later, a continuation of the battle raged. The Union, from the newly captured Morris Island in its waters, bombarded Fort Sumter with shells. General Beauregard was suspecting an attack and replaced artillery soldiers with infantry who repelled the northern foot soldiers that had arrived. Afterwards, the Confederacy still controlled the fort, but it would now was only debris and nothingness. After the battle, an ad appeared in a leading newspaper encouraging people to join New York's 103rd D Regiment, semi-permanently stationed to defend Morris Island. This regiment has seen honorable service during the siege of Charleston. It's now recruiting in New York. Bounties paid for veterans, veterans amount to $852. Their camp is on one of the islands near Charleston Harbor in a very healthy location. The ration furnished are excellent and abundant. In fact, we now know that Morris Island was an icky, dirty marsh. The Union march toward Fort Wagner had been slow because of mud. A battery on the island was called Swamp Angel. And when the Union dug trenches, they discovered dead soldiers who had sunk into the muddy ground. This was just one example of ads that could have drawn gullible young boys into the armed forces. And these aren't just cute kids. Imagine 11 year olds fighting alongside full grown soldiers, seeing blood and gore, walking over dead bodies. It's impossible to process the bloody scenes endured by children who should have never been allowed to participate. One famous example was Sergeant John Clem, an 11-year-old with youth and intelligence, according to General Rosecrans. Um, Clem became Lance Sergeant and had three bullets go through his hat during the Battle of Chickamauga, when a Confederate colonel yelled, Stop, you little Yankee devil! Clem pulled out his gun and fired it, killing the colonel. As a result, he became a sergeant. Because of these small battles, bells of equality ran triumphantly throughout the nation, preparing itself for a successful reconstruction and beyond. Reconstruction affected uh, everybody in the South while it was happening. It, it changed the political structure, it changed uh, the nature of race relations to a large degree, it gave the uh, free uh, former slaves uh, civil rights, political power, uh, a real opportunity to, to uh, forge a, a life as, as free people in, in the United States. The push for blacks to be equal began with Reconstruction 
then the 1960s civil rights movement, all the way to the groundbreaking election of Barack Obama. But it all started with small battles and individual soldiers of the Civil War, such as the siege of Charleston Harbor. The massive amount of child soldiers made them an important part of the Union Army especially. But thousands don't even know what they died for, while the ones that lived through the bloodiest war wish they were dead, and we would still have prevailed without them. Therefore, putting the next generation in harm's way was a horrendous mistake. Only if the war became extremely, extraordinarily close would it be necessary to include children. Today, we must take this as a lesson to prevent child labor and fighting across the globe. The cruelty must end. Clearly, that small powder boy sailed to his next destination, bloody and tired from the cruel battle unrightfully forced upon him. But the overall battle, and thousands like it, became small but instrumental causes in the Union's victory, ensuring one strong, emancipated nation that would be able to grow and prosper once more.